All right, for the last several lessons, we've reviewed over a lot of normal aspects of patients with PA catheters. Now, having all that as a foundation, it's really time that we start to discuss some changes that we see, in particular with the waveforms and the values that we get from this catheter. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. All right, now in a previous lesson, uh, we looked at the different waveforms that we see at various points along the path of the PA catheter. Um, those were the normal expectations of what we'd see with the waveforms, but especially with the sick patients that we see in the ICU, we can have changes to these waveforms and the values that we get. So I'll discuss these and several different abnormalities that we can see, but know that these are certainly not all inclusive, but hopefully will help to give you an idea of uh, how to think through some of these and really kind of what's happening. Um, as we go through, I will flash up and put up there as reference some of the normal waveforms and values. That way we have that to compare to. Now quickly, I do want to hit on our leveling and zeroing um, because you always want to remember to make sure that you are leveled and zeroed to know that the numbers that you're looking for as well as the waveforms that you're looking at are actually correct. So we need to be doing that square wave test to ensure that we have the proper dampening uh, and I am going to link to a lesson up above here where I talked about this more in depth when I was doing a discussion on arterial lines, but it's still very applicable here. All right, so to start off first, let's talk about our right atrial pressure or our CVP. So again, here's an example of what we'd expect for a normal right atrial pressure waveform. And if you remember, our normal pressure is going to be either 0 to 6 millimeters of mercury if they are spontaneously breathing, or 8 to 12 millimeters of mercury if they are vented. Um, but do also remember that normally we have our A, C, and V waves, and as well as our X and Y descents. And normally our A wave is going to be the highest wave here. And remember that the A wave is that atrial contraction, and V wave is filling. Remembering those will help you to think through some of these things when we see abnormalities in this waveform. Now, before I talk about the, the changes that we see in the waveform, um, in general, let's just talk about some of the reasons for increased and decreased right atrial pressure. So when it comes to our increased right atrial pressure, some causes here can be things like fluid overload, high intrathoracic pressure, so here, think your PEEP, or some high pressures in your pressure control ventilation as well as things like RV dysfunction, uh, if the patient has pulmonary stenosis, if they've got a left to right shunt, if they have tricuspid regurgitation or even tricuspid stenosis, cardiac tamponade, constrictive pericardial disease, restrictive cardiomyopathies, cardiogenic shock, and obstructive shock. So a lot of these are going to be things that are either not allowing the blood to move forward or causing that buildup backwards or creating uh, impediments to that flow going across there so that we see those elevated right atrial pressures. Now for decreased right atrial pressure, um, typically this is just going to be related to either hypovolemia or uh, potentially if they've got some medications that are expanding the vasculature. So a decreased SVR can certainly do this as well. All right, so when we're looking at the waveform itself, um, one thing we can see is we can actually see elevated A waves. So this is where the A wave is going to be even higher than it normally would, and here's an example of that here. Now this is something that typically occurs with increased pressure with atrial contraction, such as some sort of obstruction or resistance. So if we think about that, some of the causes are going to be tricuspid stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, if they've got pulmonary hypertension that the heart's trying to beat against, if they've got a thick, non-compliant right ventricle, uh, or some sort of RV dysfunction, that these are all either going to create an obstruction or add increased resistance, leading to an even taller A wave when the atria contracts. Now, kind of a variation on this is something that's actually referred to as a cannon A wave, and this is where the A wave is just absolutely huge. 
And the cause here is actually our AV disassociation. So think our complete heart block, um, as well as VTAC, V pacing, uh, and even tricuspid stenosis in some cases. So in this example here, the atria is basically contracting when the tricuspid valve is either closed or in real bad cases of tricuspid stenosis, where it's so stenosed that it's hard to get flow through there. And this is what leads to these massive A waves. All right, so here is our next example here. And if you remember, we talked about where the A wave is typically gonna be the highest wave. Well, in this case here, we actually have elevated V waves. And remember, the V waves is filling, so this is gonna be something that results from increased volume or flow. So, some examples where we could see this increased volume or flow into the atrium would be something like tricuspid regurgitation. Um, they could also have something like a rare LV to RA shunt, that this would also increase flow into the atria. All right, in this next example here, here we are looking at absent A waves. And this is going to be something that we can see with a fib, uh, and even to some degree with a flutter. Um, here we have our C and our V waves that are going to be the most prominent, and then we're either going to see those fib or flutter waves, um, and we're, potentially we're going to see some beat to beat changes in that morphology of how this waveform looks. All right, now next here's an example of something that's different, where we actually have a loss of the Y descent, so following that V wave. And this is something that we can see with cardiac tamponade. Basically, with tamponade, we've got that blood that is building up around the heart. It's restricting the amount of space that the heart has to function in. And this also leads to an equalization of pressures across the chambers. Um, and thus, we don't get a large flow from the RA to the RV once that tricuspid valve opens. And so that's what we see here. So we still have our drop off after the atria contracts, but then during filling with our V wave, and then once that tricuspid valve opens, we really don't see a big drop off in pressure because the pressure is already still high and equalized from the tamponade. And then finally, it's gonna be actually a rapid Y descent. Um, and this is something that we can see with constrictive pericarditis, restrictive cardiomyopathy, and severe tricuspid regurgitation. So here, we're having rapid filling of the right ventricle, leading to rapid outflow of blood from the right atrium, hence the steep Y descent. And this is an example of that here. All right, so moving on, next let's actually quickly discuss how we're going to tell the difference between uh, if we are seeing a PA or RV waveform. So here are two examples of a waveform. And to start off, if you wanna go down into the comments and tell me which one is our PA waveform and which one is our RV waveform, either the top or the bottom. All right, hopefully you guys remember the stuff from that lesson uh, you were able to tell here. But basically looking at these waveforms, the, the way that we can tell is if we look at the diastolic portion of this waveform, if we have an increasing diastolic pressure, then we know that this is a right ventricular waveform. And if we have a decreasing diastolic pressure, then this is our pulmonary artery. Now with the pulmonary artery, we do also have that dichrotic notch, which also can be a giveaway, but sometimes we see some morphologies where it kind of looks like there might be a dichrotic notch on an RV waveform. And so we really don't want to completely rely on that and really looking at that, that diastolic trend, whether it's going up or down, that'll really tell you if it's RV or PA. All right, so on to our PA waveform. So before we go into a little bit about the waveform, um, if we discuss some of the things that can lead to elevated PA pressures, these are going to be things like, obviously, pulmonary arterial hypertension, um, patients who have pulmonary hypertension due to left heart failure uh, or some sort of mitral valve disease, so either mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation, um, if they've got pulmonary hypertension due to lung disease uh, and or hypoxemia. So here, think of things like emphysema, interstitial lung disease, etc. And then finally, pulmonary hypertension due to chronic PE. All of these are going to be things that lead to elevations in those PA pressures. Now, for some causes of decreased PA pressure, um, once again, hypovolemia is potentially a cause here. Um, pulmonary vasodilators, uh, they can do this as well. Uh, right heart failure, obviously, if the right heart's not ejecting much blood, then we're certainly not going to have a high pressure. 
uh, as well as if we've got an obstruction like a PE, that that can potentially reduce our PA pressures as well. All right, so a couple things I did want to discuss when we're looking at changes to the waveform in our PA pressure is let's say we have a PA pressure here that's going along and then all of a sudden it changes to something like this. So we have this sudden large waveform, this sudden change in our waveform here. What could possibly be going on? Well, hopefully you were able to tell that what we have is a pullback from the pulmonary artery to the right ventricle. So the tip of that catheter is no longer in the pulmonary artery. It's now come back into the right ventricle, and we're now seeing an RV waveform. So quickly to fix this, um, if you just inflate the balloon, we can observe the RV waveform go into the PA waveform, and then it should also go into the uh, occlusive pressure or the wedge waveform. Um, and then at that point, we just remove the air, and we're back in the pulmonary artery. Now make sure this is something that's within your scope and within your policies and procedures in your hospital. If it's not, if we have something like this happen and your patient's having lots of ectopy, obviously we don't want to just leave that catheter in the right ventricle that that can be causing problems. Then we're actually going to need to pull the PA catheter back and then have a provider come back and refloat it. So essentially we would pull the catheter back until we're out of the RV and then back into that right atrial pressure or CVP waveform. Now another thing that can happen is once again, let's say we, we've got our PA pressure here and then suddenly the waveform changes to this. We'll hopefully identify this as a wedge pressure, so our occlusive pressure waveform. And so the first thing that we want to do here is we just want to ensure that the balloon's not inflated, so this is a quick easy check. So uh, make sure that that clamp is open. Go ahead and disconnect that syringe. If there's any air in there, let that come out of there naturally. Then from there, if we've done that and we still have a wedge waveform, then we can try things like repositioning our patient. So try them on their left or their right side. Um, you can also have them take some deep breaths and cough as well. Um, that may help to dislodge the catheter, which basically at this point has just gone into a a uh, smaller vessel and it's just become wedged in there without even having the balloon inflated. If this does happen and you're still having trouble getting it unwedged, um, we don't want to flush a wedged catheter. So something to keep in mind um, with these reposition changes and the deep breaths and coughing, if that's not helping, make sure you get on the phone or get a hold of your provider quickly so that they can um, come make adjustments. Um, potentially we may need to pull this back some as well. And then one last interesting thing with our PA pressure um, that we can actually see is with our bundle branch blocks. So um, whether we have a right bundle branch block or a left bundle branch block, that this is actually going to change the alignment of our PA pressure and our arterial pressure waveform. So the reason for this is obviously the PA pressure is measuring pressure after the right heart contracts, and then the arterial pressure line is measuring pressure after the left heart contracts. So with a bundle branch block, for example, if we have a right bundle branch block, conduction to the right ventricle is gonna be slower because we're not going down that bundle of hiss and having that really quick contraction. Therefore, we're actually gonna see the left heart contract before the right, leading to our A-line waveform preceding our pulmonary artery pressure. Now, in a left bundle branch block, we actually have the opposite. So now the left side of the heart is going to be delayed compared to the right. And as a result, because that right heart is ejecting first, we're going to see the pulmonary artery pressure come before our arterial pressure. So just kind of a cool thing if your patient has a bundle branch block, uh, something that you can see with the changes to this waveform. All right, so now let's talk about our pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, pulmonary artery wedge pressure, pulmonary artery occlusive pressure, whatever we want to call it. Now, if you remember that this is a reflection of pulmonary vein pressure, which in turn is a reflection of left atrial pressure since we have no valve in between. And then when the mitral valve is open, we have one communicating path all the way with the left ventricle. And thus, this is a reflection of left ventricular end diastolic pressure, or LVEDP. And so again, here is the normal waveform here. Um, this is something that resembles our right atrial pressure, if you remember that, that waveform there. But cases where we can see uh, a low wedge pressure is going to be in cases of hypovolemia, uh, as well as obstructive shock, such as uh, PE. Now, cases where this can actually be elevated, um, typically with our wedge pressure, that we're actually going to have the V wave that's going to be 
more prominent in the left atrium when we compare it to our A wave. So that being said, if our A wave is actually elevated, so again, this is left atrial contraction, then this can be something like mitral stenosis, uh, if they have some sort of LV dysfunction, so whether it be systolic or diastolic, um, if they have LV volume overload, so the atria is having to contract harder against a higher pressure, um, as well as if they've had an MI with decreased LV compliance, that this is going to create more resistance, increasing pressure when the atria contracts. Um, and again, here's an example of that here. And so here we have that elevated A wave when compared to the V wave. Now, some causes of having uh, a high wedge pressure would be things like a high LV EDP. So if we have LV hypertrophy, uh, dysfunction, or heart failure, um, as well as we can see elevations in uh, pulmonary vein stenosis, uh, if they have mitral stenosis or even mitral regurgitation, aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation, a left to right shunt can also do this, restrictive pericarditis, and tamponade. So how do we know if the cause of our elevated wedge pressure is the result of a high end diastolic pressure or from pulmonary vein stenosis or something like that? Um, the only way we can do this is if we actually get a direct left atrial pressure. Um, and th so this is only going to be in cases where the patient's in cath lab. The way that they do this is if the patient has a PFO, they can actually run a catheter uh, across over to the uh, left atrium and get a pressure over there. Um, as well as they can also do a, a septal pun puncture and go across the uh, septal wall between the RA and the LA uh, and then go in there and then get that LA pressure. Let's say you get your wedge pressure and it's equal to your LA pressure or your end diastolic pressure. What do you think might be the cause here? Well, here, this is going to be high EDP uh, or even cases like mitral stenosis, where we just have a higher pressure trying to get into that left ventricle, which makes its way back and is read as an elevated wedge pressure. Now, let's say we get these measurements and our wedge pressure is actually greater than our end diastolic pressure. If this is the case here, then this is actually going to be stenosis. So this increase of pressure is a result of stenosis of the pulmonary vessels. All right, another important thing to, to recognize with our wedge pressure is going to be elevated V waves. Um, so if they're just slightly elevated, that this can be a result of something like mitral regurgitation. That said, if we've got really extreme, especially sudden V wave elevation, and especially following an MI, that this could be wide open mitral regurgitation. And here, looking at the waveform here, you see basically we have a loss of the X descent. Essentially, we have so much blood coming back into the left atrium from the strong contraction of that left ventricle due to this wide open mitral valve. All right, so the last thing that I want to talk about with our wedge pressure is something that we call an overwedged balloon. And this is where, let's say, you are inflating your balloon to get your wedge pressure, and this is the waveform that you see. Essentially, what this tells us is that the PA catheter is in a smaller vessel than can take the full volume of air in that balloon. This is a problem and can lead to either damage to the vessel as well as potential balloon rupture. So if we see a flat waveform like this when we're trying to get a wedge, the very first thing that you want to do is remove the air out of that balloon. Then from there, you want to slowly reinflate the balloon until you see a good pulmonary artery occlusive pressure waveform. As soon as you do that, record how much air it took to achieve that without reaching the overwedged pressure. And then this is something that we want to make sure and pass along so that way anybody who does a future wedge will know how much air they should use to get that proper wedge reading. All right, so that was a lot of good information talking about the uh, abnormalities and changes that we see with the waveforms and values uh, across the, the path of travels of our pulmonary artery catheter. Um, these are things that you're going to see pretty common, like I said, especially in the sick ICU patients. So um, it's good to have a good understanding of this and to understand why it is you're seeing some of the changes and then think through some of the pathophysiology that would be causing those changes. 
So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release, otherwise in the meantime here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.